सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली The time of Burma's planned independence almost 75 years ago on the 4th of January 1948 together with the six star flag to be raised at precisely 4:20 a.m. had been very carefully worked out. The Union Jack was lowered precisely on schedule. British Imperial soldiers marched past new Prime Minister Thakin Nu also known as unu to the tune of all lang syne then almost immediately the stars began failing the new nation less than 3 months after the independence ceremony the so called red flag faction of the communist party of burma led by thakin thantun had gone underground and launched an insurgency Karen ethnic armies threw open the gates of the notorious insane prison in Rangoon now Yangon suburbs Kareni Pao Mujahideen seeking a Muslim state in Arakan and even the army's own first Burma rifles all of the country seemed to be rebelling in the face of what the stars had promised over the past 7 weeks insurgents have once again swept across Myanmar led by the so called three brotherhood alliance a coalition of ethnic militia which include the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance the Taang National Liberation Army and the Arakan Army so called operation 1027 has succeeded in pushing the army out of an estimated 300 outposts and bases a separate operation code named 1111 has seen army bases collapse across the Kareni state fighting has extended to the border with Mizoram with the Kuki National Army's insurgents seizing a military outpost in northern Tamu on 11 December Tamu residents reported that multiple air strikes were carried out in defense of the base before its besieged soldiers eventually fled into the jungles fleeing troops and insurgents have taken shelter across the border in india and ethnic ties between kuki and mizo communities on both sides of the border pose a growing threat that this conflict will get sucked into indian soil ever since the myanmar military regained control of the state in 2021 in a coup india just like china and other nations in southeast asia has seen its power as a kind of necessary evil The military is seen by many diplomats as the only force that can hold together the country in the face of its competing ethnic militia often with deep links to drugs and crime. The unprecedented success of the insurgent campaign though has led political scientists and analysts of Myanmar like the scholar Zakari Abuza to suggest the collapse of the military regime may not be that unlikely. a correct alignment of the planets and stars would mean democracy is then restored to myanmar but the slightest miscalculation could unleash a terrifying new era of narco empires on india's sensitive eastern borders even as burma prepared for independence two military jeeps raced through the streets of rangoon bursting into a cabinet meeting where the country's political leaders were considering action to disarm a militia the soldiers assassinated independence era patriarch aung san that's father to nobel laureate and political leader aung san suu kyi as well as nine others the country's prime minister under japanese occupation u so was tried and executed for ordering the killing lawyer mong mong has written in a book on the trial for imperial britain the assassination was not undiluted bad news shall we say 
till it turned on Imperial Japan just three months before the fall of Rangoon, Aung's Burma National Army or BNA had fought alongside Tokyo. Aung had actually appeared at the Allied Victory Parade in Rangoon wearing the uniform of a Japanese major general. Historian Hugh Tinker writes, The BNA had been called the traitor army by the British. But now London felt compelled to hand over power in Burma, knowing it could not fight an insurgency there even as its military moved eastwards into Indonesia and eventually China and Japan. Aung San's death likely provoked some private smiles in London. But Britain knew that new Prime Minister Wu Nu faced severe challenges he had to be helped to overcome. The tenuous peace achieved by the counter-insurgency campaign of 1949-1951 didn't last very long. Thousands of soldiers of the Kuomintang or KMT, that's the nationalist regime which was defeated by China's revolutionary People's Liberation Army, found themselves cut off in the southern province of Yunnan. The KMT soldiers retreated south from Yunnan across the border into Burma. Eager to harass China's new communist government, the Central Intelligence Agency or CIA paid for and equipped these KMT remnants, historian Kenton Clymer records. Even a CIA-operated cargo aircraft flew in weapons to KMT forces strung along the Salween River all the way down the Tenasserim coast. The operation ended up transforming Burma in many fundamental ways. In their efforts to secure their claw hold inside Burma, scholar Bertil Lindner explains, KMT commanders tied up with ethnic militia who were seeking independence, like the Karens, the Karenis and the Mons. They traded weapons and money in return for space. The KMT also built an opium empire to fund its proto-state in Myanmar, taxing local opium farmers and shipping refined heroin to corrupt officials in Thailand. In less than a decade, Myanmar's opium production of 30 tons a year expanded to several hundred tons. For its part, the military also acted to protect its own influence in the country, seizing control of powerful sectors of the civilian economy. It took control, for example, of the Burma Five Star Shipping Line, a key freight company, a bank, and suppliers of high-quality imported goods. The generals thus acquired a power base independent of the political leadership. The foundations for a military-dominated state had been laid, just as they were, you'll recall, from past episodes of Security Code in Pakistan. From 1962, when Myanmar experienced its first coup d'etat, the country became locked in a deadly mix of ethnic warlordism and military authoritarianism. The ethnic militia and the generals fought, made truces and built personal fortunes, scholar Mang Ang Myo notes, all under the shadow of an expanding drug trade. Even though Myanmar's military has been historically suspicious of superpower neighbour China, remember the events that took place after 1952, the country remains heavily dependent on its ties to the People's Republic. Even though India's hopes of building a transport corridor linking its northeast remained stalled by insurgent violence and extortion, the ethnic armies now fighting the military have pledged to protect Chinese investments from crude oil pipelines to casinos. The military, for its part, has embraced Beijing's Belt and Road initiative after the coup. Lindner has suggested that the genesis of the insurgent offensive isn't all nice, fuzzy democracy stuff and might lie in the military's unwillingness to act against organized crime cartels in the Kokang region. These cartels were given safe haven by the generals to engage in online scams and illegal betting operations. This was because the generals themselves allegedly profited from these criminal enterprises, making them stonewall China's law enforcement efforts. This argument is disputed by other analysts like Nian Peng, 
who say that Beijing is deeply committed to the regime's survival and wouldn't encourage insurgency against it. As the only easy point of connection to the Indian Ocean for China's southern provinces, Myanmar has enormous strategic significance for the People's Republic. The democratic opposition's links to the West, moreover, give China reason for suspicion about the motivations of these ethnic insurgent groups. Either way, whichever argument is correct, China seems to set to benefit from the crisis in the short and middle term. The country is currently brokering talks between the Burmese military and the Three Brotherhood Alliance and has called for a ceasefire. As the principal supplier of weapons, illegal and legal, to both parties in the conflict, China is well positioned to assert its influence. For exactly that reason, this crisis confronts India with an extremely difficult strategic conundrum. Three decades ago, India was compelled to sacrifice its ties with insurgent groups like the Arakan Army in a deal that involved the Myanmar government finally acting against insurgents in the Northeast. The ongoing violence in Manipur has flagged the real and present threat that those insurgencies could ignite once again, in which case the military in Myanmar would be a valuable ally. At the same time, the growing influence and success of the ethnic armies and their ties to communities in the Northeast mean India cannot completely alienate them either. In Mizoram, once home to one of India's most bitter ethnic conflicts, sentiment on the issue of military atrocities against their kinsfolk runs very, very deep. And New Delhi cannot be seen to be siding with a military junta over the interests of its own citizens. Finding a way to negotiate these compelling interests won't be easy. Maybe is even impossible. Escalating warfare can make it difficult for India, though, to indefinitely defer taking a side. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm contributing editor to the print. Thank you again for watching Security Code.